Welcome back to Writers on Writing. And we now have with us in the studio, Ethelbert Miller, or rather E. Ethelbert Miller. Welcome, Ethelbert. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you for coming to Brooklyn. Yeah. It took, <laughs> it took it's quite some time, time right? for you to exactly. be here. Right. And uh, just to share, Ethelbert Miller, you're a lit well, you call yourself a literary, a literary activist, activist, and you are a literary activist. And you are the author of several collections of poems, including How We Sleep on the Nights We Don't Make Love. And uh, your memoir, your first memoir, Fathering Words, The Making of an African American Writer. And now your most recent memoir, The Fifth Inning. Mm -hmm. So very, very interesting book. Very, very interesting book. It came out at the same time as Baseball season sure. started. Of the marketing campaign. Yes, yes. Um, very good. Why this memoir? You wrote Fathering Words back in early 2000. Right. Why a memoir at this point in your life? Well, I wrote Fathering Words back in 2000 because I loved my father and my brother. And as I write in that book, um, being a poet, I felt the amount of grief I was dealing with, I needed to father more words. I felt that the poetry form was not suitable for what I wanted to express. I could go back, I could look at people like Amiri Baraka or Hakim Adabuti. As they became more political, they almost adopted a longer line. You know, I remember like Haki had very short poems, Think Black, Black Pride. By the time he became much more political, you know, he's writing almost like prose poems. And you know, you have a lot you want to say. And I felt that that's where the title comes from, Fathering Words. Um, when I got to the fifth inning, um, the fifth inning, using baseball as a metaphor, here now I'm getting to the end of my 50s, where in Fathering Words I was sort of like mapping my life. Now I'm mining my life. I'm going a little deeper. I went back and looked at, you know, exactly who I am as opposed to the family I came out of or how I um, went off to Howard University, I experienced the Black Arts Movement, you know, traveled, became a writer, which I felt was very important to tell other people that this process. But now, as I turn to the fifth inning and um, I look back at the number of people that I've lost, uh, people to suicide, heart attack, diabetes, I go down to cancer. Uh, I realize that I can't take being 50 for granted. In baseball, um, the 50 goes into the record books as an official game. You know, I always tell people you never know when you're at a clinic or a hospital where somebody might ask you for the ball, and that's it, you know. And so in this case, um, the fifth inning, I felt resonated in terms of, uh, for many people my age, um, I was just recently in a senior citizen home where people were in their later innings but could look back at friends they had lost, like maybe husbands, you know, wives uh, in their 50s. Uh, and then I would also say that you never know when a book might capture a moment in time. So when I look at the fifth inning coming out in this year and I look across at Michigan, Ohio, states really hit with high unemployment, where people who felt they were going to retire, have a nice pension, all of a sudden it's the fifth inning, you know, and they felt they, they're being laid off. Right. They don't know what to do. So the book speaks to that. Right. It does speak to um, many levels, um, people at many different levels. Uh, it's interesting. I, I never heard you talk about the concept of fathering words, and, and I, I really like that. And your book is almost like a prose poem. Can you talk a little bit more about how the poetry form influenced uh, this book? Well, you know, as a writer, you know, even though my beginnings might be in the Black Arts Movement, I came of age as a, as a poet in the 1970s. And so in that case, um, the women's movement had a very strong impact on me maturing as a man and also as a writer. Um, people like June Jordan, Alice Walker, and Tazaki Shange were very good friends, and I learned from them. Uh, in terms of my own work as a poet at that time, I was stepping outside of myself, using the persona, um, looking at women's issues. Um, I tell people it's very difficult to be around someone like June Jordan and not be responsible for what you're supposed to do as a man. And so, you know, issues of rape, issues of cancer, I began to write that, about that in my poems. And so when I got to uh, my memoir, um, one thing I also discovered is that I was a baby of the family. And as I always tell people, I thought my name was shh, you know, because you get to the door, they, nobody want to tell you anything, or so you got to listen. And um, because I, I didn't know a lot about my family, um, I went back and did what I was doing as a poet. I said, wow, who knows the stories? My sister knows the story. 
So in the Fathering Words, you'll see that book is structured in two voices. Right. My, my, my sister who's five years older than me and, and mine. And um, the big test for that book was she was one of the first readers. It had to work for her. Right. I mean, she enjoyed what I was able to do in terms of capturing the things that she could not say, especially her relationship to my mother and father. So um, just, just to continue on, you, you use the fifth inning to really talk. You talked about personal relationships and fathering words, but in the fifth inning, you really, really go into to more personal relationships. Oh, yeah, go back to your, your marriage, right? Yeah, your right, marriage. Right. I mean, that, yeah. that takes a lot of courage to oh, talk sure. about. Oh, sure. That's why I dedicated and, the book to my wife. <laughs> yes, your wife, and, and, and to your children, too. And, right. and, then, and the challenges you had about how to structure that, what to include and what not to include. And I learned that from fathering words, you know. Um, one thing that writers do, we, we create books, and what happens, we can create a moment in time. We can freeze people. I look at my sister, for example, I might, this might be the negative thing out of Fathering Words. Mm -hmm. When she would come down to Washington, D.C. to visit me, maybe at, at a program, people familiar with the book would say, oh, oh, you're the woman from the book. I thought you'd be one of these big church hat women. <laughs> women you know. and, and what happened, she laughs at it, but she became very conscious that you know, she was being seen a certain way in print that was now affecting herself uh, in terms of her own life. She's not a public individual like, like I am. I did learn from that in terms of how my sister responded, and I knew as I was writing in the fifth about my children, who are now much older, I did not want to reveal anything about their lives that would force a graduate student to always be popping up at their door asking them a question mm -hmm. about the fifth inning. Mm -hmm. And so I was very much aware of that. And, and, and this comes from me being a literary activist. I'm always looking at the future. I'm always looking at what might be in a memoir that's not in a letter. What do we say? What do we not say? And this is at a time in which we all live public lives. You know, I think we're writing these memoirs during the time in which a key issue in our society is the issue of privacy. We write these memoirs at a time in which when we look around um, the, the, the neighborhood, the new buildings that go up are almost all glass. And, and I always joke, I tell people that um, I recommend that you write your memoir before someone writes your biography. Oh my goodness. But um, it's, it really also speaks to the whole, the whole need to document, as you, to document mm -hmm. things before they flee away. It, and, yeah. and to become the, the official documentarians and the the people who who can who are the visionaries and who can see see the future. I think that's true, but then I also add on that that we, we we're also storytellers, and so in this case, what we we're also looking at is is who's going to uh, create the narrative, you know, and, and which narrative is true, right? Uh, and the power of that. And so uh, when I look at father and words, I, I definitely created the narrative in which I wanted to take my father, who was an immigrant from Panama, and and was a working class man and elevate him to making his life heroic. I knew I could do that with literature, mm -hmm. you know, and that was my goal in terms of that book. What was the most challenging aspect of writing the fifth inning? I think the most challenging thing was, was dealing with things like um, state of my marriage, um, dealing with things like depression. Um, I looked at how many people who were younger than me who read the book, who looked at me a certain way, and um, said, well, I saw you as being a successful person. And, and I said, I never saw myself that way. You know. And they were surprised. And they were very surprised. I mean, the mayor of, of Washington, right, D.C., right? Right, right. <laughs> right. Or we're having, the, the thing I always look at is that people have a tendency to uh, call me like the, the godfather of this literary movement. And I chuckle at that because the godfather, very, if you go back to that Marlon Brando movie, the godfather's a very lonely individual. You know, even when the, the undertaker comes in the beginning, you know, he wants him to, to, to revenge the, 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 the assault on his daughter. And the Godfather pretty much said, you didn't even send me a birthday card or whatever. You know, you want me to do something for you. But what happens is that there's a loneliness that goes with that decision making. Um, I've been in situations, large foundations, working behind the scene, where I had to fight to get people grants. And there's some people that don't speak to me. But, you know, you have to do that. Uh, and so, you know, I accept that as a responsibility, you know. Uh, there are many people who I can't stand. But if I'm in a room, um, I put that aside. And it's just the work. You so know. it goes back to the responsibility of the artist. The sure. responsibility and creating of the your writing, narrative. And creating, creating your narrative. Creating, creating right, your narrative right. and realizing it's not going to be easy. No. And, and you know, I feel that the, the narrative of African American writers is one that we always have to keep fighting. It's like dueling banjos. And so what happens is that when you're in positions where you see someone trying to silence a story, someone saying, well, you know, uh, we'll give the award to so and so, and, and you know they're not that good. You see, and, and, and you see this in almost every field, you know, in terms of African-Americans 
don't have to be twice as good. I mean, to sit here at, a, at, at in this studio and have a country look at Sarah Palin before they look at Barack Obama is insane. You see, and I've seen a situation where people say, "Well, well, Toni Morrison, um, I don't think she can write." <laughs> you know, right. and I got to put it with another Philip Roth novel. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't understand that. Well, that's why we need, as you said, literary activists. We need literary activists. And we need what you're doing in terms of conferences to study what what we're doing. Well, you know? well, thank you. Um, just um, just to carry it to another level, you also teach. You you do a lot of teaching, and you teach memoir. What message would you have um, to people who are interested in writing a memoir? How do you decide what to leave in, what to take out? Um, what is the craft? Because as, as you said a little while ago, we are in the age of the memoir mm. writing and right. everyone thinks that their story should be told. Well, I look at it in terms of, of two groups that I just got finished talking to. One was uh, a jail in, my, in, in, in Maryland. Another was a senior citizen home in Maryland. Two different groups. Uh, to the prisoners, you know, I was concerned about, you know, what they could learn from their lives. Um, what they were a witness to. Now, when you talk to people who are inmates and you raise the term like witness, you know, they knew, for example, I said, you know, many times you can't find a witness when something happens. Why? Because no one wants to tell truth, the truth. No one wants to testify. That, re that re demands a certain degree of, of courage. And so I was saying, even though here you are in prison for whatever you did, now that you begin to tell your own story, it's gonna, you're going to have to be very courageous. You're going to have to say, okay, this is my relationship with my mother. This is my relationship with my father. Okay? For the seniors, the challenge was in terms of now, what have you witnessed again in terms of being blessed to live this long, mm -hmm. okay? Um, there's a point in terms of what would you like to reinterpret, you see? Uh, and that becomes a very interesting thing, not, you know, where you say, okay, let me take the camera and move it over here, okay? Or let me be philosophical so that now I use my life so that someone who picks up the book can, can learn from it. So now you're instructional. And then I think we have to speak to the future. We have to create books in which somebody, 20, 50, or 3,000, whatever, picks it up and understands what it means to be an African American in 2009. Well, I thank you for doing that. And I thank you for that thank message you. and for um, continuing the work of making sure that we're looking forward. Right. And um, I think one of the things that really uh, moved me in terms of, of your memoir is really getting to know the full person. You know, oh, this another book. Yeah, so. <laughs> Lee, but, but you know, the, the life is, it's really like, um, what is it like to, to be a person who's the, the writer and, and the activist and the family, You're putting it all there? And how do you keep that balance? And right. how do you keep yourself um, full of confidence yeah. and the motivation. My, I'm still waiting for my wife's book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be a different <laughs> perspective. Right. So I want to thank you for coming to Brooklyn. Oh, and um, I want to encourage our listening audience to look at um, The Fifth Inning by E. Ethelbert Miller, which is a wonderful story. And thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Writers on Writing. You've been watching E. Ethelbert Miller talk about his book, The Fifth Inning, and Asha Bendeli talk about her book, Something Like Beautiful. This has been Writers on Writing. Remember, the writer is always writing, the reader is always reading. Keep reading and writing. Empower yourselves as readers and writers. This is Dr. Brenda Green signing off.